Hey everyone, this is part two of the very special interview we were able to conduct with James Latterin of Prayer Storm, a prayer life that never sleeps. I want to give a quick plug once again that all of the links to follow James and Prayer Storm are going to be in the description below. Make sure you go to prayerstorm.org to stay updated with all the tremendous content that they are putting out. You are going to be supremely blessed by this interview. We love y'all. It seems like spiritual warfare is a topic in the church that can kind of get very miscued. It can almost get mystical and and all over the place where people become intimidated by it or even afraid of it. And I I really Mm. wanted I know that this is something you contend in on such a regular basis, and our body is growing more in this. And I would just love if you could bring just an abbreviated context for us to begin to go after. I know it's a loaded question. Yeah. So, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. So, just to put your mind at ease, or maybe at not ease, I don't know, as the case may be. um, If you're a believer, you're already baptized into warfare. It's just part of that's what that's part of this journey. You know, uh, we're up against an enemy, and uh, he is, you know, vicious and wicked and evil, and his aim is to destroy, steal kill you know and just do whatever he can to just oppose the kingdom of god advancing in the earth that is a given and the sooner we realize we're in a battle the better now there is a balance where i think there's some people that will go on an extreme and you know want to cast out demons from a cup and from a drink and from you know finding demons and everything i'm not, I'm not demon hunting and we're not looking for demons but you got to just be aware that there is no way you can advance the kingdom of God and demons will get and demons will not be upset or let me say it this way the kingdom of God cannot break in to a region without uh, power as in for the kingdom to advance there's going to be a clash with whatever already exists in that place and when that thing is being pushed back. There are times where there can be reactions. There could be manifestations in the natural. And there are Christians that sometimes are just unaware of the fact that what they're feeling or dealing with is a manifestation in the natural of a war going on in the spirit. So the um, the story of Jesus going on the boat and the storm, you know, that Jesus was asleep and the disciples were afraid. I think it's Mark 4, Mark 5. They were afraid they were going to die because the storm was intense and Jesus was asleep. Now, the picture of the storm is the picture of spiritual warfare. The storm, the assignment was to drown the boat, really, was to drown Jesus in the boat. And that's not going to happen, right? But Jesus wasn't even bothered. In the storm, what do you have? You have two things. You have the wind and you have the waves, Okay, so the disciples couldn't see the wind, but they could feel it. Now, what they could see was the waves. The waves, the water was getting into the boat. As the water got into the boat, the boat began to sink. So the wind is something you can't see. The wave represents that which you can see. The wind is the unseen. The wave is the seen. And what was going on was something in the unseen, the wind, was causing the manifestation in the seen, the waves, that was causing the boat to sink. When you're in spiritual warfare, like I said, we're not looking for demons everywhere, but in obeying the Lord like the disciples were doing and seeking the Lord and pushing in for his purposes in regions and nations and your families, the devil will often get in the way or try to oppose. Now, when the enemy gets in the way of what God is doing and you know you're called to do something and you can sense the enemy is at work, you are in a position where you need to now begin to resist the enemy. And I find that many Christians don't know how to resist the devil. They think it's something spooky or something weird or super spiritual. There's no, listen, it's normal to rebuke the devil. If you can sense his activities, you rebuke him. You don't, you don't, you don't make the devil comfortable. Many Christians are cohabiting with the enemy they're called to evict. The enemy is clearly at work in your marriage, at work in your family. You can see he's at work in your children because of the the manifestations of the waves in the natural, but you're not discerning it. And so you're reacting to the waves as opposed to rebuking the wind. And if you read that story carefully in Mark, 
when Jesus woke up, look at what, read carefully what he did. He rebuked the wind and spoke peace to the waves, to the sea. He rebuked the wind and spoke peace to the sea. He didn't rebuke the sea, he rebukes the wind. In other words, he got mad at the invisible, but spoke peace to the visible. Our flesh is not, uh, sorry, our fight is not against flesh and blood. We know that scripture says that. The weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, they're spiritual. And so when we're dealing with uh, unseen beings, spirits, causing manifestations in the natural, and we have to discern what is going on in the spirit by the Holy Ghost. And then through prayer, begin to rebuke it. You know, there are not many Christians that rebuke the enemy. Again, many Christians think when they're under attack or when they can sense the enemy is oppressing them, maybe it's through all kinds of nightmares or all kinds of, you know, loss, unusual things going on around them. You know, they, they think what they need to do is pray and ask the Lord to come and rebuke the enemy on their behalf. Jesus, please, would you come and get rid of this devil for me? Jesus, please, would you come and get rid of this demon? There is no way in Scripture that we're asked to pray that way. In fact, James tells us, submit yourselves to the Lord and rebuke the enemy. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That is the basis of spiritual warfare. You submit yourself to the Lord so you can't be living in sin. By the way, holiness is spiritual warfare 101. <laughs> if your life is not right with God, forget about coming against the enemy. I always say this. <laughs> You can't have authority over an enemy you're sleeping with. So if you're in bitterness, unforgiveness, backbiting, jealousy, envy, pornography, immorality, you know, uh, you know, lack of integrity, all name them, the works of the flesh. If you're functioning in any of those, forget about talking about any kind of warfare. You're already part of the enemy's camp. And, you know, you can't use the enemy's tools and not pay tax. <laughs> When you start to take things that are from the enemy as a believer and use it, the enemy is going to come back for those things you've taken. But he's also coming, as in he's going to come into your life to take things, not just what you have of his. In fact, he's not going to take it. He's going to leave that with you. He's going to take things that belong to you that God has given you. Now he has access to them because you have his tools in your camp. Okay, so, so spiritual warfare 101 is holiness. Submit yourself to the Lord. Then... It didn't say pray to the Lord to come and rebuke the devil on your behalf. You are the one, the believer, that does the rebuking. Now, many of us who are in ministry, and those of you who serve God in different capacities, if you're sensitive, you notice certain patterns, and you notice that it's the enemy at work to try to resist you. Like sometimes when you're, I don't know if, Dominic, you can relate to this, sometimes when you're preparing for a really powerful meeting or something is about to happen, you might end up in a disagreement with your spouse or a fight it's on the silliest thing or maybe something happens to the children. Something happens that unsettles you on the inside. And, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I don't even want to go to that meeting anymore. Oh, I don't want to preach anymore. I don't want... But you don't realize that the enemy looks for any open door around you. And his goal is to unsettle you and to cause you to not be in the peace you're supposed to be in before you deliver the word of God. So what? that is spiritual warfare. I'm not saying your spouse is the devil. <laughs> I'm not saying your children are the devil. But remember, remember, Peter, one moment Peter says, you're Christ, the son of the living God. The next moment, guess what? The devil was talking through him. And saying to Jesus not to go to the grave. And Jesus had to rebuke the devil. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying rebuke your wife and say, <laughs> get thee behind me, Satan. That will be awful. That will be awful. Now, even me as, as a husband, I know there are times where in my vulnerability, I can submit to the flesh and the enemy use the, uses the flesh as a platform to express his ideas. And then I have to repent say to my wife, I'm sorry, because I go in the flesh or I go irritable or whatever it is, because the enemy works with the flesh. You know, what, what your spirit is to the Holy Ghost, your flesh is to the devil. So the enemy uses the flesh to get us out of alignment with God. And so the more you realize these things, the more you know that there are things in the unseen realm that cause manifestations in the sin realm. There are times where some people are dealing with all sorts of evil thoughts, and they don't realize it's projections from the enemy they don't realize, I mean, put, put that in context. Some people watch bad movies. So if it's bad movies you're watching and all these terrible things, then obviously you open the door for the enemy to do that. But then there are other people that are not necessarily doing that, but they just find all these thoughts. It's like they, they can't control these kind of thoughts. I feel like there's someone watching that this is for. 
you can't, it's like you, you, you're having these perverse thoughts just coming to your mind in a way where you're, you're struggling to understand where it's coming from. Well, it, it, it's projections from the enemy. And that's where you need to begin to rise and begin to resist and rebuke because the enemy, uh, sorry, the Lord says in Corinthians about, you know, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. You know the scriptures for casting down imaginations. So the enemy functions in that imagination kind of realm. He uses thoughts. So there's warfare that happens in the mind. There's warfare that's internal, but also there's warfare that's external based on territory. You can go into a territory and there's things that the enemy is doing there. And if you're not sensitive and walking in alignment with God, you can come under what's ruling in that atmosphere. And yes, you're a believer. You may not even be living in sin or whatever, but because of your ignorance, you can easily play into the hands of the enemy where, um, uh, you know, he's able to have access points to oppress you. Because I travel often, sometimes I step into a territory for the first time and I begin to feel things going on in that territory. Uh, I have dreams about it and I can sense some things that are prevalent in that space. Now, I need to watch myself. I need to pray. I need to buy. Sometimes it's revelation to also help me to know what the people in that region or maybe people in the churches I'm ministering in are under. And so it helps to be more specific in warfare and knowing how to pray effectively. But to wrap this up, because I, I said to you, this could go on and on. So let me just wrap this up. Spiritual warfare, in my opinion, is very simple. Uh, it can be complicated too and deep because there are legalities. But let's not go there. The simplicity of it is this. James, I believe it's James 5. Submit yourselves to the Lord. That word submit yourself is huge. There's repentance in there, alignment with God in there. There's all sorts in there. If we're submitted to the Lord, it makes it easy for us to now resist the enemy. Some people are trying to resist the enemy, but they're not submitted to the Lord. And we have to resist the enemy. We can't just be quiet. So, you know, I'm going to ignore him. I'm just going to act like he's not there and everything's going to go away. <laughs> the times you need to stand and resist, confront, and kick it out. All right. That's beautiful. I, I think that it is so good to have that ground zero verse, like in James 4, as you're saying, submit to God, resist the devil, and he shall flee from you. I love how just starting at a place is what how you grow how you mature in things but mm -hmm. just really anchoring in that is so so good i i asked you right before we got on if you'd be willing to speak in to to this topic last time you came to our body we you we we were able to have you for two sessions but one of the sessions was in an intimate setting with our with our core group and you began to speak on covenant prayer and covenant prayer is not something I ever really hear about. And even in my walk with the Lord and being a part of different ministries, I've never even really heard that terminology. And when I heard you speak on it, my heart really burned. And then I recently heard a sermon that you shared that was amazing. And I highly encourage everybody to go to Prayer Storm and watch it. It's, a, it's called Wasting Your Life on Jesus. It's powerful. But would you be willing to share just a little bit and give a lens for covenant prayer. Yeah, so covenant prayer was something I learned about um, on, the, on the back of a testimony of a guy that I got connected with in Uganda who was a witch. It was a high-ranking warlock, and he was sent to destroy a church, and this church was causing so much disruption in the spirit realm because they had stepped into something that they called covenant praying. And um, as I look through scripture, I could see this pattern of covenant praying too. I am convinced we will not see the sorts of things we're, we're wanting to see God do on the earth without this kind of prayer. And it is coming into alignment and agreement in a deep way with a community of people in such a way that you pray in a very focused, uh, consistent, intense manner. And... Uh, your heart are knitted together where, you know, there is no room for discord and manipulation. Now, let me just explain that further by giving you the story of this church without going into all the details. This church had 20 women and one pastor, and uh, they stepped into something called covenant prayer, and they decided they were going to pray for six hours a day for 90 days. In fact, the pastor said to them, we're going to go on a prayer journey and we're going to change the world. We're going to, you know, contend for revival and all these things. I said, but this is how we're going to do it. 
We're going to pray for 90 days, and we're going to pray from the hours of 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. Um, and we're going to pray uh, prayers of uh, intercession in worship, uh, prayers of repentance and warfare. So there were three things they're focusing on, worship, repentance, and warfare. And so th- this is where it gets interesting because anyone can make that announcement. But this is where the covenant came in. They said, if we are on day 80 and any one of us comes late to the prayer meeting, we're going to reset and start from day one. If we're on day 85 or 89 and any one of us is sick and can't come to the prayer meeting, we're going to reset and start again. And so the question the pastor put to the church was, okay, based on those terms, who is ready to go for this? <laughs> and now, now let me just give you a bit. <laughs> let me just give you a bit of backstory. Now, I don't know if you Americans kind of understand the concept African time, <laughs> but <laughs> there is something called African time. <laughs> Do, do, you, do you know what I mean? So when people say African time, say, say a meeting is meant to start at 10 p.m., African time might be 11.30 p.m., for example. If it's meant to start at 10 a.m., you know, African time might be you know, 11.30. For example, I was invited to a party uh, uh, just a couple of days ago. The, it's a it's 60th birthday. It's an African uh, uh, party thing. On the invitation, it said 3 p.m., my wife said to me, oh, it's Africans. You know, you probably want to shop at four. <laughs> I showed up at four. It still hadn't started. <laughs> so I think it probably started around 4.30. So, so I'm, th- that's, that, I'm just telling you. Now, not every African is like that. Like, I've got an African background. I don't, I don't work with African time at all. But some people are like that. So we're talking of a culture where time, you know, it's one of the things that they don't, they just take it very lightly. So... I'm saying that because this is in Uganda and the people making this commitment were people that had that mindset of the African time. So it was a big stronghold for them to make that commitment and show up and be there on time. So the fact that they entered into that covenant and agreement meant their prayer shifted in ranking and impact in the spirit because now they were binding themselves to each other in their commitment. There was a covenant binding them. And this is one of the things we miss in our prayer meetings. We don't, we're not bound together by covenant. We're just praying, you know, and, get, and I go upset and I move to the next church and I go upset and I go and stand my church over there. We're not bound together in any kind of covenant. And by the way, in case you didn't realize, the day of Pentecost came as a result of covenant prayer. Because Jesus told them to not depart, that's part of the covenant, and to pray until, that's part of the covenant. So they stayed together, kept praying every day. Their prayer meeting had a start time and no end time. See, they had a prayer culture. We have a prayer meeting. And yet we want revival they had. (laughs) Do you see? It's It's called delusional hypocrisy. We want what they had, but don't want to give ourselves the way they gave themselves. We, we, want, we, want, we want the products that came from the price that they paid, but we don't want to pay the price. And part of the price was that they were knitted together at a heart level, bound together. And so they journeyed together in this prayer. And that covenant was the basis for their intercession, for their devotion, for everything that they did. And because of that covenant, the, their, prayer were, their prayers were multiplied in impact in the spirit realm. Because we lack an understanding of covenant in the church. So we, we don't know how that affects our prayers. And I could, go off and I could go on and on about this, but I'll say this. The constitution of your community as a prayer team, as a church, the, your constitution and your relationships and how you deal with each other, the constitution of your community is more important than the fervency of your prayers. So it doesn't matter how long you pray, how loud you pray. If your community does not have a strong constitution in covenant, your prayers are neutralizing authority. And the enemy is not scared. Because 
again, you have his tools in your camp. You have unforgiveness, bitterness, competition, blah, blah, blah. Oh, you see, then you, you may be praying for five hours, but you're shifting nothing in the heavens over the region because the territorial spirits in the region have got inroads into your camp. And you remember what Jesus said, the God of this age comes and has nothing in me. That nothing in me is so key. Now, we need to get nothing in us. We need to make sure we are delivered, cleansed, and then we need to be bound together. So that binding together is what we lack. And then the consistency in in the binding together. So there was a rhythm to their prayer. They kept going and going and going and going. And they didn't allow anyone join them. So, you know, by, by the time they had gone, I don't know, 70 days, they had shut down the powers of darkness in the whole region. They were releasing, I think because of their prayer, that church, about 7,000 churches were in revival around the world. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord have mercy. So 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 I'm saying we, we don't understand covenant and we don't understand covenant prayer. And so that's the dimension we need to start to journey into where we can say, okay, Lord, bind us together. And let's how about we try to journey to pr in prayer together? We could start this on a small scale. You know, let, let, let's go on a seven-day prayer journey. How about we do a seven-day prayer journey and we'll pray for nine hours a day or pray for six hours a day or pray for four hours a day and we we commit to just come before the Lord. Or we go on a 21-day prayer journey and we all come. I don't know, we can try this in different, you know, I guess shades and manifestations, but there is a binding of a covenant and it multiplies the impact of the prayer. So there's a lot we could say about that, but let's stop that right there. James, uh, uh, you have spoken so much into where we're at as a body. And I know this is going to be a witness to even those that are um, watching from different streams and influences, but I, we have been in such this vein and you just brought so much language to what we're beginning to see. And I'm so thankful for that. So I'm really glad that you spoke on that. This, this is the, the final thing I want to throw at you. And then right after you address this, if you would just close us in prayer over the, okay. the desire to go deeper in prayer and to, to mature in the things of God pertaining to prayer. My last question for you is kind of one of those that just knowing your heart, knowing all that you're pioneering, all that you and your family and those near you, what is the Lord ministering to you the most in this moment? And I know we probably hit on a lot of it today, but if you had to stand before the body of Christ right now and give a charge, what would that charge be? I remember, you know, just hearing that question because you sent me that question and I didn't have time to think of an answer. <laughs> but when I heard that question, I thought, oh, that's a deep question. <laughs> I, I need some time to reflect on that because that, that is huge. That is huge. And I think, you know, in, 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 in many ways, I don't think it's going to be anything different to the emphasis the Holy Spirit has already given me because um, I realized that we all are carrying different facets of the heart of God to our generation and there are dimensions of his heart that he imparts to an individual and they carry that in their ministry. So you listen to their minister, you can feel that thread of that emphasis from the Holy Spirit. You listen to another minister who is walking with God, there is a slightly different dimension to the emphasis, but it's still part of the heart of God. And so I think the main, one of the main things on my heart is, um, and I've, I capture it with this quote, and I feel because of the days that we're living in, it is so, so important that the church is walking in greater discernment to know who is of the Lord and who is not. The fact that they're great preachers, the fact that there are lots of ministries out there, you to, everyone is going, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, a stream right now and everyone is preaching and got their own, I don't know, whatever they're doing online and, you know, trying to gain followers for their thing and everyone is now an expert in this or that or whatever, you know. So you can use your marketing skills and personality skills to kind of draw a crowd. And the problem is I feel like the church at large, especially in the West, is very immature in its um, 
uh, discernment and it's a walk with the Lord, even in many parts in Africa as well, because I minister in Africa too. And so there is just waves of deceptions and there's just mixture coming in. And I'm not saying to say I'm perfect, but I am seeking to walk in the pure, undiluted path that God has for me and for the church. But I'm saying there's so much pollution in the church right now. And so this quote captures a bit of what I feel uh, is going on. The 21st century church has become a nursery where babies are being fed and not a barracks where warriors are being bred. And what I feel is there is this sense that people are gravitating more towards things that make them comfortable. And I remember I was in America, I don't know when it was, maybe a year or so ago, and I was just reflecting on the ministries in America, the the preachers in America, and the I guess the, the American gospel, the version of the gospel that is being exported from America. And I was just reflecting, thinking the diet, the word diet coming from the church in America that the church is feeding on, this word diet is not preparing the church in America for the days of battle, the days of judgment, the days of chaos that's ahead. The church is not being prepared at all. All they're being given is sugar, sugar, sugar. So they're not, pre- they're not being prepared for the days ahead, the day of the Lord, and the intensity, even before the day of the Lord, the intensity that the world is coming into. And what I'm seeing is when the, the enemy begins to rage on the earth in the way he's going to increasingly do, Many believers are going to fall away at this time. At this point in time, many believers will not be able to stand when those days begin to increase in their intensity because the messages we're receiving, it's not building us to be warriors. People are babes just having milk and just comfort, make me feel good, preach me happy. And all these, you know, preaching has become a performance, all these things. And I'm just concerned about the church falling away, not connected to God's um, emphasis in these end times because we've kind of, you know, hipped around, our, we've brought around ourselves preachers that are speaking things that are just making our flesh comfortable in the here and the now while we're not being prepared for the battle that we're actually in right now and the enemy is gaining more territory. I'll wrap up by saying it's kind of like, um, you know, you guys in America, you're probably familiar than us in the UK with tornadoes and hurricanes and all these things. I don't understand all these weather patterns, and I don't even know why you still live there with all these crazy weather patterns. But anyway, anyway, <laughs> it's scary for, for us because we don't have those sort of crazy weather patterns. Now, if you're in a region and they're warning and saying, you know, that tornado is coming or a hurricane is coming, and, you know, you're like, well, I don't feel anything. I don't see anything. And you just sat there, you know, just, you know, watching movies and just enjoying yourself. And on the news, they're shouting, saying, get out of there, get out of there. It's coming. Get... And you're like, well, I can't see anything. So you think because you can't see anything, you're immune to the impact of what's coming. In the same way, just that idea is why I feel like there is something coming. It, 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 it's come to a certain degree, but there's more of it coming. And many people in the church, I just sat down in their homes and, you know, just chilling out and, you know, just not really being prepared in, in stamina, in capacity, in urgency for what's ahead. And I believe the days ahead are scary. And I think it's time for the church to arise and be equipped, especially in prayer, to hear God for ourselves, to seek him intensely, and not to be swayed by all the winds of doctrine and ideologies that keeps coming left, right, center, all across the body of Christ, all across social media, that we're rooted in the word, focused, seeking God in holiness, and walking that path, that narrow path he set before us. So some of that captures a bit of my burden um, uh, at the moment, and um, I'll stop there. Oh, and I need to pray. You said I need to pray. That's what you said. (laughs) I will pray over all of us right now. Oh, Father, I tell you what, a prayer I pray often is, Lord, help me. Lord, have mercy. Lord, help me to not miss what you're doing. Help me to not be distracted like the disciples in the garden falling asleep when I should have been awake. Lord, wake me up on the inside. You might want to pray this over yourself. Lord, help me to not be distracted at a critical hour. Father, fill me with your spirit of truth 
deliver me from deception, doctrines that are from the pits of hell. Lord, if I am deceived and not even aware that I'm deceived, expose it by the spirit of truth. I want your spirit of truth to prevail over my mind, over my ideologies, over my emotions. Expose what needs to be exposed. Shake what needs to be shaken, Father. I want to walk in the path of purity. I want to walk in the path of holiness. Lord, have your way in me and make me a warrior in the spirit. Make me a warrior in prayer. Train me. Train me by the Holy Ghost. Make me wise by the Holy Spirit, Lord, to walk in alignment with you. I want to please you, Father. And by the way, as I'm praying these prayers, I'm encouraging you to pray these same prayers. Lord, I want to please you. I want to walk with you. I want to be all you're calling me to be in these days that we live in. So, Father, I pray over every single one watching that we will not miss our hour of visitation, that we will not become dull in the moment when you're wanting us to be so on fire and burning that we will not be swept away in the wave of delusion, that we will not come under the kind of prevailing spirit of the age. Deliver us from every inward tolerance of Jezebel. Deliver us from every inward tolerance of the spirit of this age and bring us to a place of purity so that we can walk in authentic authority to advance your kingdom in the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you again, James. And just a reminder to everyone watching these to get connected more with James and Prayer Storm. We're going to have all the links in the description below. We're so honored that you took time out to be with us. And we can't wait to uh, even be able to see you again in person in the States in the near future. But God bless you and your family. And happy birth, happy early birthday to you coming up as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.